this section of Killian's Chronicle that I'm going to show you, that Richard, when Richard asked me if I would do a film for this seminar, I said, Richard, <laughs> in four months I can't do a film. But uh, as I, and so I said I was going to do something from the Bible Moralisée, which I will do in the next, in the second uh, part of the talk. Um, and I'll do an analysis of the hospitality theme in the Book of Judges that I hope you all had a chance to read the 19th chapter of. But in the, uh, Killian's Chronicle does, as I started to think about it, I realized that in Killian's Chronicle, there is a scene that relates to hospitality. There is an encounter uh, between a Native American boy uh, and this Irish slave who was on one of the Viking ships, who was actually recorded as being on one of the Viking ships in the Icelandic sagas. He uh, get, gets off the ship uh, with his sister in the Icelandic sagas. And I kind of weave something around there and, I, and then my imagination just takes off and it changes from what the actual Icelandic sagas say happened to that slave, uh, which they just give a mother sentence or two about. Um, but then I do take the Icelandic sagas and use them as a kind of a framework for inventing a story and a plot and characters, etc. But on the other side, I have to invent Native American characters as well. And in order to do that, I had to go to um, the recorded mythology and the, the recorded uh, texts that, that uh, 100 years ago, uh, and earlier even, uh, since the 1600s, uh, Europeans recorded about Native Americans. For the most part, I tried to do those that had been, I tried to immerse myself in those texts that had been taken down in the Native American languages. That's why I gave you a text to read that was actually in one of the Algonquin languages, which is the group of people who would have lived on the Northeastern Shore in, in New England and Nova Scotia, uh, where this Irish slave would have come off the ship. Um, these Proto-Algonquin peoples spoke a language which is kind of like uh, the root language, uh, like Latin is for French, German, Italian, etc. Proto-Algonquin is the root language for <coughs> Micmac, Maliseet, Massachusetts, Pequot, uh, Nipmunk, a whole bunch of languages that, are, that would, be, have, would have been understood, as well as Passamaquoddy, um, a language which is still spoken in the northern part of Maine. At any rate, this Irish slave escapes from a Viking ship in a very tumultuous bunch of scenes. He's rescued by Native Americans who quickly um, take him away from these Viking, this Viking who's pursuing him. Um, and the moment that I'm going to show you the scene after this very um, emotional uh, period in the film where there's lots of action and energy, the Irish slave finally comes to a spot where he's free of the Viking pursuers. He's come to a spot on these shores, and that's the moment where you're going to see it now. Uh, the, the language that you will hear the Native Americans speak is the language of Passamaquoddy. I was fortunate enough to have find a Passamaquoddy native speaker who had been brought up by his two elderly aunts. Um, and we, he, I wrote the script in English after I learned as much as I possibly could about Native American mythology and history and, and everything that I could from their, their texts. Um, and then he put that back into uh, Native American uh, language. And I'll speak more about it. Sit with me, but you might glance over every once in a while. I'm giving you all the best moves. All right, well, I'm gonna do this. And then, you're gonna do this. Do you 
な。Over the situation you got me in, thought you were going to win one, but then I realized that as a deer, you're very likely to make some very silly move. So, you move your king like that. I move my queen. I take my rook. Ah, instead of doing what you should have done, you move your king like this, which allows me to take my queen like this. Take your knight. It's gone. Then when you move like this, I take your rook with my knight. Put my queen here with my knight, and with my other rook, it's checkmate. Bicek uktuklaji dule. Bicek uktuklaji edlasko you. Mode mitseo. Chirili. 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 Chickadee. Chickadee. Chili. 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 Bidil. 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 Meep. 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 A Bruce. A Bruce. A Bruce. A Bruce. He was. He was. While he was teaching me his words, he told me his name. It was long and difficult to say, but we decided I could call him Kichi. Abrus. 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 Now, why did he run away like that? So you can see that the section that you read, um, that I sent around, was one of the sections, was one of the things that I was reading when I was immersing myself in this culture. And um, I didn't think about it at that time, but when I started to create the character of the little boy, when I decided it would be a little boy who would greet Killian, on these shores, um, that, that particular section that I had read came back to me, and I read it again. And I mean, it's, it's very hard for me to, re to recreate what was going on in my head at the time. But obviously, you can see that I learned through having read that uh, something that is not too different from what we would expect, that there is some kind of an initiation thing, there is some kind of um, coming of age thing that happens in the Native American community, particularly in the Algonquin community. As you read, 
a young boy and girl, in the tale that you read, a young boy and girl were fast. They went out into the woods anticipating finding a guardian spirit. Now, you're reading a translation as I was, but of course I knew and you know also that the words are translated by people who were probably um, influenced by, well, definitely influenced by European language and guardian spirit. Um, when I read enough of the Native American material, I realized that there can be these guardian spirits, so to speak, in animals, in plants. Um, uh, there is also some over overriding kind of general guardian spirit or spirit that Native Americans of this particular group of Algonquins must have had also because even through the translations we can see what sort of powers are attributed to that figure and though we can't define it exactly uh, it eludes us we have some idea that there was some general kind of of, uh, of spirit otherworldly uh, spirit or not really otherworldly in the sense that it wasn't a separate heaven thing it was something very much part of, of the world. So when Kichi, this little boy, his name is Kichi, when, uh, and that's short for a very long name that, that is actually his name, which has another meaning, which is sort of a secret because you'll never find it out in the movie. But when he, uh, when he comes into the woods, he is looking for a g animal guardian spirit, like the little boy, Black, Black Rainbow, in the text that you read was looking for an owl spirit. He had a talk with an owl. So I realized he had a talk with an owl. Well, Makichi can see this figure, Killian, talking to a deer. And the deer becomes part of Killian in a way. And then Kichi sees them together. And as you could see, he, he accepts this as his guardian spirit, he's in the woods, he's fasting, he's the right age, he's looking for this person, and he finds him. So from Kichi's point of view, he's accepting him. This, the rest of the movie, in, in another part of the movie, you learn this. You, could, you wouldn't have known it up until this time, so I didn't bother to tell you. But it gets spelled out a little bit later um, in, in the film. Then, as it happens, the word for guardian spirit, or for what he, guardian spirit with deer, is Kilian Anginap. When I first read that, Killian Aginap, I decided the Irish slave is going to be called Killian because that worked for me in this scene. The little boy says, Killian Aginap, or he hears Killian say, Killian, my name's Killian. He says, Killian Aginap, and then Killian says, Killian. And so that's another, he, there's another way that there's a bridge made between the guest <laughs> and the host, if you will, in this particular situation. Um, and then, the, you know, Killian, the older uh, person, experienced person, tries to initiate making contact. Uh, and then I also found out in the course of much reading and much research um, what the Native Americans call in their languages the different birds. And there's a certain onomatopoeia uh, that happens with certain animals. I mean, uh, I guess I know that, you know, uh, Little children here call a, a cow a moo moo, and they, what do the little children call a cow in France? I don't know. It's some other, meh. and instead of moo moo, it's meh. <laughs> but anyway, there's a certain sound that people use often when they when they, and so but as that happens, chilili, chickadee, <laughs> was what I, I you know zeroed in on. I thought ah that's going to be that's going to be okay, um, so I used chilili chickadee for the bridge, that helped the boy and the man come to the notion that, ah, maybe we can find out how, maybe we can make a language bridge too. And then they go on um, uh, and they start to learn each other's language, um, which I eventually, when, when, you know, at a certain point, when they're saying things that you wouldn't understand, I put, on, we put subtitles in. Killian's understanding them, you're understanding them, would become part of, um, of that world. Um, the other thing I wanted to, Say, of course, I had to know something about the Irish also. I've been teaching Irish art at Boston College different parts of different semesters for almost 30 years now. Um, and of course, I knew that the Irish did know how to play chess. Not only the Irish, but the Icelanders did know how to play chess. There are little chessmen uh, that are found, that have been found in the archaeology of, of, um, of Ireland. So I knew about that. Um, and could also, and then there's a deeper level for me, which I don't know how much it gets communicated throughout the whole film, but 
there are lots of times in this film where there are understandings that come about. Um, the Irish had a belief in shape-shifting also. Man, dear, dear man, man, dear, dear man. You know, in the toy, it's full of shape-shifting all the time. And in Native American mythology, there's um, a lot of shape-shifting also. Um, you, may have, you might have seen uh, when, when Kichi comes back, the sec the, when he, he first sees him, and then he goes and runs away, he actually runs away to engage in a ritual. The ritual is he makes an amulet. And the amulet is a dear man. And that's why the camera goes to the amulet and then up to his face. That becomes evident also later on in the film. Something happens with the amulet and we learn. I mean, it comes together, you know, why that's exactly there. Um, and just to show you um, that, I mean, the art department, my art department who worked with me on this film, did um, a terrific job. And one of the things we had to do was get thousands of of documents, and one of the documents that, you know, petroglyphs are some of the things we use, and you can see here, um, you know, the head of a deer and the body of a man, and the head of very abstract animal-like head there, body of a man. Later on in the film, I use this and this, and here's another kind of petroglyph. Uh, anyhow, so that's um, my little expose <laughs> into hospitality uh, a thousand years ago, my imagined uh, rendition of hospitality. Years ago. Okay, so um, our our presentation that uh, Matilda and I have been working on uh, is uh, of the uh, Bible Moralisé, the Moralized Bible. And I think I sent some pictures through, which I doubt if they were le legible for you because it's, they're very tiny pictures, and I'm going to explain them. But first, I'll say a thing or two about the Moralized Bible. I do want to sit on some kind of. Thing. The Moralized Bible um, was created in France. Um, in the 1220s, and that's very important because a lot of the iconography is going to relate significantly to that, that place and that time. In Paris, at probably in the Royal Scriptorium of Louis <coughs> um, in around 1220. We, it's a remarkable work, and the one that I'm going to use is actually the first one that was created. Not, not, this is a leaf from one of the Bible Marlies, but the first one that was created, we think was created around 1220, um, uh, in Paris. This one is from a slightly, a couple of years later, also done in the Royal Scriptorium, but I wanted to show you this leaf because it shows how the Bible Marlisée was done. Here we have an ecclesiastical figure. He's tonsured with his hair cut around there, and he's wearing a monk's robe. Um, and he is very important here. He has a book that's open, and he's giving instruction. That means speaking in medieval art. He's instructing the artist. Now, the artist is actually drawing something that you're going to see in a minute. He's, draw, he's, drawing, he's drawing these, a page like this, and that's important. Um, he's doing it this, this way. The artist is a lay person, hmm? um, and he's taking instructions. Now, the particular Bible Marise that I'm going to use is from, is from it's in Vienna now. It happens to be Vienna 2554. Um, and this is the, you've probably all seen this page. It's a remarkable page. Uh, it shows, as you can see here, God creates heaven and earth, the sun, the moon, and all the elements. Uh, and God is here bursting out of the frame. And what's God using but a compass? Now, that's interesting in itself, that God is using a measurement compass to create the earth, which is in Kuwait here, the sun, the moon, uh, the waters, and the land. And he's making it into a circle. And he's sort of pushing it off so that it can get started uh, in uh, the firmament. But what's even more remarkable here for me is that the artist also had to use a compass. He's making little circles to make what he's going to show us, which is this Bible Moralisé, or Moralized Bible. Okay? So he himself uh, is making a, a subtle uh, nod to the creative powers, I believe, of the artist. This artist we call a master artist because although the iconographer, the churchman, who was telling him what to, what to draw, 
uh, determined what he would draw. He determined how it would be drawn. And that's very important. He did all the underdrawings of this particular manuscript, and there are over 5,000 of these separate individual scenes on all these pages. Mm -hmm. And what they consist of are parts of the Bible and an allegory that relates to each different segment of the Bible. Now, as I will show you, um, this Bible was, is not, it's not in accord with what you read, for instance, in the Judges uh, Book 19 that I had you read. Neither are any of the other parts really in accord with the Bible. The, icon, the person I'm calling the iconographer, the churchman, made selections for the purposes of, of making comments on and allegorizing certain elements of French uh, culture, certain issues that related to the church, to the, that related to the times. As people do all the time, he took the Bible and used it for his own purposes changed some little thing here in a blatant way actually changed some uh, not little thing but big major things and then made the allegories the allegories to his mind the way he uh, constructed it were the true uh, what the true meaning of the bible was these this was the true underlying uh, meaning of, of of the scenes of the bible so we'll start you read the judges so you know a little bit about the backstory that uh, a wife or concubine, slash concubine, left her husband. Hmm? She went back to her father, it says in the Bible. It says, in, I, I, I mean, to do this, I researched the Old Testament. I researched the Vulgate. I uh, went to uh, Josephus, um, and then Philo <coughs> and Rosa Cubos. I'm, all, I'm not going to burden you with all those commentaries. But when there's an important one, for our purposes, I will highlight who said what. OK, so um, in. Um, in the Old Testament, the Vulgate in general, there is a question whether she's, uh, this woman is a wife or this woman is a concubine. She goes back to her father. She leaves her husband, who is a Levite. Mm -hmm. okay. um, he goes after her. He brings her back. And on the way back, they pass through, in the Bible, it's Gibeah, which is a city in the, Benj in the tribe of Benjamin's a locale in uh, the Holy Land. Okay. Um, and they find when they're in that city, it's night, and they're sitting in the middle of the city of the town, and no one comes to help them. They, no one has helped them, except a good man comes all of a sudden, who happens to be from the same tribe as the husband, the Levite. Um, he comes in the same area, Eph, the Ephraim, Ephraim, from the tribe of Ephraim. Okay, so here this good man, hmm, Ix, uh, takes the Levite, the text is going to say uh, deacon, uh, he accepts him, um, and here is the Levite's wife. Hmm? Here is the servant, these are the donkeys, and the man takes him and brings him into his house. Now what specifically can I say about this image that just recounts something like the story, and this is pretty straightforward here. Um, um, as you can, I, I, I wrote down the, the text that's over here, which isn't too different from what the judges says at this point. But deacon, um, deacon is the word they use for Levi, because the Levites were the people who, in the old temple of Solomon, in the Herodian temple, also were in charge of the services. Okay, they took care of the temple, uh, and they also did the musical stuff. Anyway, so the deacon comes to the city of Bethlehem, that's a little bit, that's a change, and it's important. She had actually gone back to her home in Bethlehem, but I think that the iconographer did that. He wanted to make some allusion, perhaps, to Bethlehem and Jesus and Mary and Joseph, oh, Joseph and Mary not finding a home there, and finds no one to lodge him. And he is abandoned, and a good man comes and lodges him and his wife and his servant and his ass. The good man, as I said, is here. He has a cross on his brooch. Uh, he has a hat on. Often a hat means that the person is a Jew. Not always, but sometimes it does. Um, and he ha and the, the wife is very um, piously attired. Her hair is covered, uh, and she wears a kind of wimple there. Uh, and even the donkey has a sign on him um, that is known as the um, that is known as the pilgrimage uh, sign, the cross of the pilgrimage. Now, what is the meaning, the allegorical meaning of this that's written down here and that's shown right here? The allegory is 
that it signifies philosophy who was separated from faith by the world and Jesus Christ took her and put her in the Holy Church. So here we have the Levite is made analogous to philosophy um, and uh, she, is, she was separated from the true faith hmm, by, uh, by the world hmm, and Jesus Christ here takes her and puts her into the Holy Church. Now this over here is uh, a house that has a rounded arch that represents the Old Testament sometimes it's rep it doesn't well, it represents often the Old Testament or Old Testament things. This is a Gothic church. It has spires, it has finials, uh, and it has an apse over here. And Jesus Christ is taking philosophy into the church. Okay, so that's what he made the allegory as. Now let me, but the real meaning of the allegory is the following. At this time, in the 1220s in Paris, there was a huge controversy because um, Avicenna's translation and, and commentary on Aristotle made its way from Persia, where Avicenna in the 10th century lived and did all of his stuff, it made its way to Spain where it was translated. And by the late 1100s, early 1200s, that Latin translation of Aristotle, Avicenna's Latin translation of Aristotle, well, translation into Persian, into Arabic rather, and then into Latin, had made its way to the University. So this was the first time, and particularly that the metaphysics of Aristotle had been read in Paris, and people were astounded. Uh, however, Aristotle has in it contradictions about, I mean, he would, he, well, there are people here who are Aristotle <laughs> much better than I do, but the way it reflected in this period was that the, the, the sort of agnostic elements of Aristotle, or the, uh, what one could take from Aristotle to look at the contradictions amongst the church fathers, that was seen as blasphemous. However, it was so exciting that people in the Faculty of Arts at the University of Paris were beginning to immerse themselves in it by the beginning of the century, by the, uh, by the 1210s. And by the 1215s, there was actually a papal decree which excommunicated anybody who would teach Aristotle and who would read Aristotle in public. Now we know that there were church people who would read Aristotle in private, but excommunication for reading and teaching Aristotle. These, this interpretation, this Aristotelian philosophy that was practiced by what, were, what was in denigration called the philosopher theologians was anathema. There were the good theologians, and then there, there were the philosopher theologians. And then there were the people in the Faculty of Arts who were also reading Aristotle, and they <coughs> were also, that was also an acronym, that was not allowed, okay? So when you read, when I read philosophy here, what I understand, and you'll see it as we go on, the, this philosophy here is that poor philosophy who has been read by um, and misinterpreted and not seen through the eyes of Augustine and Jerome, but seen through the eyes of Averroes, or this text that you know that had now inter that could interpret um, uh, philosophy through Aristotelian um, uh, Aristotelian thought. Okay, so here you see this poor philosophy. She's not well clad like this one is with modesty. Her hair is long, which is something that's think thought of as lascivious actually in the Middle Ages. And she's got her, her hand up like this, which in the Middle Ages is a sign of shame. Okay? And here are all the poor scholars who have been reading that and their book is sliding down. You will note that just visually, um, the artist has placed the good man and the deacon in the same position as uh, Jesus and philosophy here. Okay. Um, as you, mm, I turn over the page. Jesus and philosophy. Uh, and um, so uh, I'll move on to the next one. Okay. Now, uh, that's, uh, this, this next section is at the top of the page, as I showed you. Um, here, um, what happens here? The next scene is 
The Sodomites come. Now, as you will see, and maybe you've already seen it when you looked at the pictures, the Sodomites is a relation to Sodom, uh, and Sodom, Sodom and Gomorrah, and sodomy, uh, and that's clearly implicit, of course, in the Old Testament text also. The Sodomites come from the city and ask for the deacon and want to take him and do him harm. Um, in the Old Testament and in the Vulgate, the words do him harm uh, are clear that they are, uh, that, that that's, by that is meant homosexual rape. Uh, we have other instances in the Bible where we say of homosexual rape, but do him harm is that, is that euphemism. And the good man comes and is before them, and he defends him, that deacon, with his power. So here we see, and I'm going to show it to you on a bigger screen. Here we see the good, the good man, and here are the sodomites. And they have, this one has an ax, uh, and he's pointing at the man that he wants to sodomize. Uh, and this, um, this other uh, sodomist here has a, his arm extending over to the neck of the man that he wants to sodomize. And the good man is standing in the portal, uh, and he's got his foot here. This is the good man who has been the good host and taken in the deacon, the Levite, and his wife, and their servant. And here they are in the host's house, feasting. They've got food on the table. Um, the, the wife and the husband are actually, um, seem, they, they seem to be in a tete-a-tete. -tete. They're having a fine time. Yet, uh, threatening at the door are these, um, are these uh, uh, sodomites. Uh, I should point out that she still has you know, her hat on. She's very well uh, concealed. She's still concealed. That these figures are shown with grotesque features, big nose, uh, large ears. Um, and those features um, are they're the features that are used for um, figures who are what they call here heretics and miscreants. They could be uh, Cathars. They could be Waldensians. They could be Jews. They could be Muslims who are called Saracens here, uh, given the Averroes connection. So they could be any of these uh, horrible uh, people. And then, to go back, that the Sodomites came to the home of the good man to take the deacon and the good man defend him signifies the heretics and miscreants who want to tear apart and pull down the sacraments of the Holy Church and God defends and guards them to show you that. Okay, these are the heretics and the miscreants. And the way they're shown in the, in the moralized Bible is that they, they have, there's, a, there's a devil coming out of his chest. And there's a snake around his sword. And, uh, again, and here they have hats which might indicate that there, there's an allusion to Jews or <coughs> they just might be, well, I think they're, my, my, my thought is that they're, the allusion here is to uh, those philosophers, which you'll see in a minute, the ones who read uh, Aristotle through Averroes. And what Jesus here is protecting, the way the good man is protecting the deacon and his wife, what Jesus is protecting is the very sacraments themselves, the cup, the chalice, I mean, and the, uh, the wafer. And inside of this protected uh, area here, um, are the pre are the the monks priests with with um, the cup that they're drinking and the sacrament that they're having? So this is what is being um, being protected. Um, so the, the sacraments, the Holy Church and God, uh, and God defends and guards. And so there we have that scene. Now, the next. Uh, part of the story, after uh, they feasted and the good man is protecting them, here's the next part of the story. The sodomites come and take by force the wife of the deacon and lead her away, and the good man suffers for her and is greatly pained and angered. Now you who read the story in Judges, I'm sure you'll remember that this didn't happen at all. The judges did not take her by force. The good man, who was made analogous to Jesus in the scene before, the good man actually offers his virgin daughter and the wife or concubine of his guest rather than allow these heretics and miscreants to come and take, uh, and take the man in the homosexual rape him. Now this is in accord, I mean, all, I mean except for Ambrose who was a little bit uncomfortable with this uh, and Josephus who ignores that whole part, all of the other, including Maimonides, all of the other commentators 
accepted this, that it was worse to have a man homosexually raped than to have a virgin daughter raped or than to have a, a, a concubine or wife raped. Some of the excuses they gave, they made up stories that are not in the Bible at all. For instance, Rashi, who's an 11th century, 11th century um, Jewish commentator who lived close by and is actually kind of influential on some Christian uh, thought in this time. Rashi says, this woman, when she went back to her father, she went away to love others. So she's some kind of a harlot. Maimonides accepts that. She is the one kind of a harlot. The pseudo says, she went and made love to the Amalekites. <laughs> now the Amalekites are the are the you know, arch enemies of the, of the children of Israel and to such an extent that they're used in the vernacular today uh, to find <coughs> enemies of the children of, of, the, of the Israelites. Okay, so this is how they try to get around it. They try to make her blame. But in fact, in the Old Testament, and in the, even in the Vulgate, she doesn't love other men. She's just there, but they still accept that homosexual rape is worth. It's kind of interesting because in other places, um, well, I'm not gonna, it's too hard to deal with a lot of that. Okay, so uh, Josephus, however, <laughs> I mean, it just goes on. I, I don't want to go into other commentators because it's going to take too long. Okay, Josephus, however, now Josephus' whole story, he, he you know, uh, on the one hand, he gets into some of the psychology of the situation. On the other hand, he really invents. And Josephus' text was known at this time because it, made th it came through an, another author called Peter Comester. But Josephus says, um, the, de the, the good man and the husband did not, not that they, they didn't offer the wife and they didn't offer their bir his virgin daughter. The Benjaminites, these rapists, they came and they took them by force, plein of force, Josephus says. Um, and, and this says too, actually, plein of force, the words right out of Josephus. Um, he, um, so that, that, is, that is the language that we see uh, illustrated here. And I want, to, I want you to see the bigger illustration. Okay, so here are those miscreants and heretics who come and take the woman. You can see they have their... One of them has uh, his hand on her breast, another one has his hand on her breast. This sign here of a man placing his hand on a, or his hand, uh, on a woman's arm, that's a sign of rape in medieval iconography, okay? Um, now, we have here their own interpretation, this iconographer's interpretation, which he told the artist to do. Oh, the, the good man is dismayed. He lifts up his hand, takes his cloak, and he's crying. You can see he's wiping his eye. The husband, which is of course not also in, in line with what the Bible, the Vulgate or the, or the Jewish or the Hebrew Bible says, he's holding up his hand in protest, and the servant is dismayed. So there's a totally different interpretation of it. And why was that done? Well, we needed a new, inter a different interpretation because of the way this is shown here. Um, here, that the Sodomites. Here's the allegory, that the Sodomites took the wife from the good man, and the good man suffered, signifies the heretics and miscreants who took philosophy from the pagans, from Jerome, the philosophy from the, from the pagans, from Jerome and Augustine. <clears throat> and they suffered and felt pain and said that they will win her yet. In other words, philosophy from the ancient world that is interpreted through Augustine and through Jerome that's fine. That's legitimate philosophy. But if you take philosophy and you read it in these new ways through the eyes of Averroes, for instance, and Aristotle, that is, an, uh, that is heretical. Okay? So that's what this is showing. So these, uh, so signifies, these are the heretics. Oh, I'm going to take it to the next. These are the heretics and the mysteries <coughs> who have devils on their neck and devils coming out of their chess. Uh, and here is philosophy with all of those pagan philosophers who formerly had been interpreted through Jerome and Augustine. And now they're being taken by these heretics and miscreants who, are, who have their arm on her and their hand over her head. And they're going to be, and those pagan, those philosophers and this, this philosophy personification who's holding all those uh, pagan philosophers in her in her breast uh, is going to we're going to see what's going to happen to her <clears throat> and here's what happens to her you read the Vulgate so you know here the sodomites come 
and take the wife of the deacon and they rape her with such force that they kill her and she dies. This is the rape scene, okay? You don't have many of these in medieval art. Um, the Josephus has her in a room and so they put her into a bed. That's not usual in the other couple of illustrations of this I know. Uh, one man um, is actually on top of her, another one is biting her arm, another one is doing is punch, punching into her eye, another one is trying to get towards her head. Um, you can see that the force of the whole composition, I haven't been talking much about composition here, but I will at this point, because the force of the whole composition, all the lines that are important are moving in this way, and then the, uh, the diagonals that go this way are pushing down on, on to her uh, to rape her with all the possible force uh, that they can. And the allegory over here is that the Sodomites took the wife and raped her by force and killed her signifies the heretics and the miscreants who took philosophy and killed and crushed and martyred her and took her virtue. So that's what the philosopher theologians who are reading Aristotle to Everolis are. They have taken her, they're the heretics, and they have taken philosophy that had been interpreted through Jerome and Augustine. They're killing her and crushing her and martyring her and taking her virtue, and here they are. We have um, these people who are philosopher theologians shown allegorically as rapists. This one has a, um, a snake coming out of its mouth. I wonder if I have, I think I have a bigger, um, yeah, I have, this one has a snake coming out of its, its mouth. This one has a, a simian creature of some kind in its breast. Um, this one has a cat that's biting his hand. A cat is a symbol uh, here, it's a kind of a new symbol in, 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 this, <coughs> in the medieval context. It means General heretics. It can be a Waldensian, it can be a Cathar, it can be, you know, Jews, it can be Saracens. It's a general sign of, of, of heretic. Uh, and they're all pushing her. You can see the lines of the, of the image. Pushing on philosophy whose poor body is curved over and all the philosophers are being crushed and her, her good book that she once held that showed the true reading of philosophy is falling to the ground and this evil reading of philosophy is opened up. And again, I point out to you that these figures have grotesque, these uh, uh, miscreants have grotesque uh, kind of uh, uh, features. <coughs> okay, so this section here. Here the Sodomites come and take the woman with whom they had their way and killed and they place her outside of the house and the deacon receives with pain and anger. You know that that's not what happened in the Old Testament of the Vulgate. She crawls to the house and she lies on the threshold and she dies there, okay? For their purposes, they needed her to be pushed uh, or to be brought uh, uh, to, um, to the outside of the house uh, and the deacon receives her with pain and uh, anger. Now, um, pain and anger <laughs> that the deacon received, that was not, that's not in the text. That's a completely uh, new thing. Uh, the interesting thing is the Josephus interpretation here, which is not, which is not shown at all, really. But Josephus, it's kind of interesting because when I was reading him, he says, the woman, she crawled, you know, she crawls to the threshold, but she feels ashamed because she was raped, and she's ashamed in front of her husband. And you know, we know in the modern world that youngsters who are raped often won't tell their parents that they were raped, whether they're young boys or young girls. They won't mention it. There's a certain shame that they feel, even though they're the victim. So I thought that was interesting that Josephus put this shame in there, though it's not in the Bible of Lisee, and it's absolutely not in the Bible either, um, the, uh, the rapists. Um, okay, so, but here, the way it's interpreted, the deacon receives her. Uh, they still have these uh, horrible, grotesque uh, images. Uh, what's happened with the wife is that, you know, she's now, whereas at the beginning you saw her with her hair uh, covered and everything, um, she's become, her hair is now uh, loose, and here her hair, her head is uncovered, her body is uncovered. Uh, the artist took a great, you know, leap to show her body uncovered. They don't show, uh, even Eve is very, very rarely shown as nude uh, in the Middle Ages. Sometimes little souls uh, in hell will be shown as nude 
in the Middle Ages, uh, but certainly not with the graphic representation of a certain amount of musculature and knees, et cetera, et cetera. This is early, 1220, it's early to show that much of the an anatomy. Okay, and that's made analogous to, uh, re uh, to signifies the heretics and the miscreants, here again the heretics and the miscreants, who trample under them philosophy and the philosophy and the doctrine of the pagans as interpreted by Jerome and Augustine. And Jerome and Augustine receive her sorrowfully. Uh, here are these, um, here are these uh, miscreants and uh, horrible uh, heretics with um, the, again, the simian creature there. Their book is here closed because Jerome and Augustine are receiving her. Um, her hair is still loose. She is still, and that's a sign of shame also, lasciviousness in general, loose hair. Her, the, the philosophers here whom, whom she protected before uh, are now falling down, and the book is open and falling down. But Jerome and Augustine are there kind of to uh, receive her. So this is the last, these are the last two scenes um, that I have to show you. Um, here, um, the deacon comes and, he, oh, in the, I have to tell you one other thing. In the Bible, in the Old Testament, it says she crawls to the door and she dies. And the Levi comes out and it's morning and he says, get up, we're going. And she doesn't respond. And the Old Testament continues. So he takes her and he picks her up and puts her on the donkey and goes to his land. Now, there's an interpolation in Rashi, which says she didn't respond because she was dead. The Septuagint also says she doesn't respond because she was dead. But because the Old Testament doesn't say because she was dead, we know what happens to her she gets cut off. There are some versions, interpretations, where she gets cut off a lot, which becomes even uh, over and above. But the standard interpretations all put in, what the Septuagint put in, and what Rashi ultimately put in, that she was actually dead. Okay, so here she is, the deacon comes and ties his wife, who of course in this book was dead, um, onto the ass, and then he goes to his homeland and puts her down. Okay, this is her. It's very unusual um, <coughs> that we see, again, um, this kind of a nude form. You can see her breasts, you can see pubic hair, you can, pubic hair, you can see the navel here. Um, and th there are, there's, the, there's another tradition of Old Testament illustration called the Octotuk tradition. And it happens that this particular scene is preserved in the Octotuk tradition. And in that scene, she's wrapped up in a shroud and she's placed on top of the dog. So she's not. Um, she's not nude, but this artist, um, should this master artist chose to show her um, in that way. Um, and um, so um, that the deacon tied his wife and then went to his home and put her down signifies Jerome and Augustine who take philosophy and put her down from the ass, which is the hard doctrine of the pagans. Here is philosophy. She's riding, uh, dead. She's, she's riding along. She's not really dead here in this, in this instance. Um, the the uh, Jerome and, uh, and um, Augustine are taking her. She's holding her book. Something can be salvaged here. If philosophy is cared for and interpreted through and salvaged by Jerome and Augustine. Hmm? And so philosophy can be read if it's read through them and not through the Averroes uh, translations of, uh, of Aristotle. We see uh, something falling down here. It's probably meant to be uh, that element that is the, the, that part of the pagan philosophy which is not um, accepted. I'm going to just show it to you in bigger so you can see it here, Jerome and Augustine and her, the donkey uh, in the body. Then um, the <coughs> next section, uh, this is the final part that I'm going to tr deal with, although it goes on and on. Um, here, the deacon comes and cuts his wife into 12 parts and sends them by 12 messengers to, to, in 12 directions. Well, once again, we have a very graphic depiction of this. We see uh, legs, we see arms, we see uh, breasts, we see a uh, lower part of the chest, uh, we see <coughs> pubic hair again, we see head, etc. And he's handing an arm uh, uh, to a messenger in 12 directions. Um, one of these people is shown as a, uh, 
a, a regular, like an agricultural, like a working figure. This is like a peasant would have that kind of a cap, and he's got some kind of a, of a peasant's tool here. However, the uh, allegory is that the deacon cut his wife into 12 parts and sent them by 12 messengers in 12 directions signifies Jerome and Augustine who took from the 12 patriarchs the 12 volumes to carry them to the 12 apostles. Now, um, this is unusual um, because the 12 patriarchs, actually that is a text that, came, that started to be, that was done in the first century um, BCAD, which um, was um, read in this milieu. The text of the 12 patriarchs is a testimony, it's kind of a confession on the deathbed of the 12 sons of Jacob. And it had, turns out, I read it because they have it online, it, it's, a, it's a text um, that is very, it confesses a lot of sexual sins. Right? And it's very anti, anti-woman. It's also, you can read it if you want to see the testament of the 12 patriarchs. Uh, you can find it on, online. Um, at any rate, that's what they, they're using it. I think they're just using it here uh, for numerological symbolism because they wanted to, they're handing down this testimony of the Old Testament fathers in this way to um, the, um, the 12 apostles. Uh, one would usually think that it would be the five books of Moses or something else, but they, he just ignored that and wanted to use it. So you can see this case for the books uh, and they are, uh, uh, they are handing them out. So um, the, old, the good man took in the, the man from his tribe, the Ephraimite. He took him in because they are both from the same tribe. He wasn't a stranger. And if you read the text, there, there are several times where, um, the, like for instance, the good man says to the rapists who come, um, he's from our people. Now he is. They're all the 12 tribes of Israel. But the, the Benjaminite rapists say, what do you mean? Since when does a stranger tell us what we can do? So they're really shown in this text to be really evil. Um, I looked a little bit into who, uh, you know, who, when wrote this text and what, what this, you know, what the history of this text is. And the, the hypothesis is, is that this is a text that puts the Benjaminites in a terrible light because it's written by the partisans of David. Saul comes from the house of Benjamin. And Saul and David, of course, those tribes were at odds. Uh, they were fighting. <laughs> and so to, to uh, relegate the Benjaminites to this cesspool of rapists and horrible figures would be probably the lens through which whoever wrote this story down uh, wrote it down. Um, the other thing one should keep in mind um, is, uh, is that um, the homosexuality um, in the Old Testament it is punishable by death. In Leviticus 20, 13 or some 20 something or other, it says that a man who lies with a man, the way he's supposed to lie with a woman, both of them are punished by death, okay? So they're working within that rubric. And it's not punishable by death to rape a woman, of course. That's not punishable by anything. <laughs> um, and matter of fact, um, I haven't gone on in this story, but God comes into this story and God takes the, takes the side of this horrible Levite who has given his wife to be raped. Uh, and, you know, and, and he's on the side of the Levite against the Benjaminites. But then God, in this story, you can read, I gave you Judges 19, this one part, but you can read 20 also. And you will see in 20 um, that God plays, they go to Shiloh and they ask for God's advice. And he tells them, oh, yes, engage in this fratricidal war. And not only kill the soldiers, but kill the women and kill the children who belong to that tribe also. Kill them all. It's like, it's like Exodus 32, you know, where God says, kill them all. Kill them all. Um, so, one thing I want to, there's one other thing I should mention, that in this text, two or three times, it does say, this is what happened when there was no king in Israel. So again, we have the Davidic argument. Uh, there was no king, you know, who could control these, uh, these, these horrible passions uh, of people. Well, today is uh, March 11th, and uh, on the Jewish calendar, that makes it Shushan Purim, the second day of Purim. Um, 
you may not know that holiday, but it is the Jewish expression of that spirit of disorder and topsy-turvy, the world upside down, which also explodes for Christians in Mardi Gras. And the interesting thing is that these are both holidays within their respective religions that lead to Passover and Easter. That is to say, the very two intertwined holidays that may stand as a sign of the intertwined hospitality and hostility that occupies us generally in hosting the stranger. And um, I'm going to go into that, but first I, I did want to thank Richard um, for inviting me to be a guest in the seminar among so many welcome guests. Did he just leave or was he around here? Um, I want to thank Pamela uh, for inviting me to respond to an outrageously gruesome but totally fascinating set of images and texts in the Bible Moralisée, which I had never set eyes upon before encountering them in her um, PowerPoint presentation. Um, I have been thinking about uh, Jewish and Christian exegesis in relation to romance, thanks to my project on the first Grail romance, but this um, uh, adds a new um, direction that I, I hope to um, pursue, thanks to, to Pamela's invitation. And I want to thank my colleague uh, Kevin Newmark for helping me make some progress with Derrida's notion of the interplay between conditional and unconditional hospitality. He is definitely not responsible for my limitations, um, but I happily refer to him any questions on Derrida that may arise in the subsequent uh, uh, discussion. Uh, Richard asked me to respond briefly to Pamela's presentation, and so I, what I'd like to do is simply outline three areas for possible discussion um, by following what we might call an arc uh, that links linguistic and textual through uh, the religious and philosophical and on to the social, political, and sexual dimensions um, as they intersect and, and I think inevitably link together from the perspective of hospitality or what Derrida calls hospitality, putting together the two nations of hostility and hospitality. And in the process, I'll be pointing out the risks and, and possibilities, what um, one commentator of Judges 19 has called lethal differences uh, as we move around the circuit connecting textual bodies, metaphorical bodies, and real bodies made of flesh and blood. I'm going to give uh, three titles to these three areas so that you can follow the, uh, the discussion. So the first title is Translatio, hosting the other text or the other's text. Uh, that is, I want to focus first on textual, linguistic, and metaphorical issues that the translation of the Bible, and I put that word in quotation marks, um, uh, uh, in, in, entails. Uh, and this can be translation from one language to another, from one people, religion, and culture to another, from one time and place to another, from one medium to another. And in, in the medieval context, translatio um, carries a number of specific um, meanings, all of which seem to be relevant here. Uh, translation uh, means, among other things, the removal of a saint's body, the physical remains, uh, from one place to another, and we have um, seen bodies moving around quite a bit here. Um, linguistic translation. Um, li every time there is linguistic translation in a medieval context, um, there is also cultural transfer from the Latin yeah. to the vernacular context, um, not only linguistically, but culturally. Um, and, and we might think, therefore, about translation as, as meaning transposition, a kind of mise au jour in French, or aggiornamento uh, in Italian, uh, which occupies a certain status within um, uh, Christian thinking as well. And finally, translatio is the word in Latin rhetorical treatises from antiquity and on through the Middle Ages um, for metaphor. Um, and uh, the Bible Moralisé uh, makes particularly urgent, it seems to me, this question of metaphor. Um, we've talked about allegory. Uh, in its simply, simplest terms, in the medieval context, allegory means to say one thing and mean something else. Uh, and that's what we're dealing with here. The move from one level of meaning to another. And this reach for, for figurative meanings is fundamental to the Bible Moralisé's multiple levels of text and image as we've seen on, on, on the screen and in uh, Pamela's presentation, the verbal commentaries um, serve to fix and explain exactly how we should understand what we are seeing and reading uh, in, in, in a play between resemblance, uh, one thing signifies by analogy, or contrast between the two levels. 
And while Pamela focused specifically on the context of this philosophical dispute um, uh, about Aristotle uh, among theologians um, and university faculty members in the university in the early 13th century, in which um, the question is really how to appropriately appropriate the texts and traditions of pagan philosophers, um, there's, there's a larger context in which I would also like to situate this, uh, which is evoked by the verbal and visual um, uh, uh, text that we've been seeing of the church fathers, Jerome and Augustine, the, the defense of the sacraments, and especially the Eucharist represented in the image that we we saw, as well as the, the whole context of the Bible Moralise as a whole. And this points to another textual dispute, obviously the Bible in Jewish and Christian traditions. Whose sacred scripture is it? Who has the right to translate and gloss it? What kinds of move from text to meaning, from letter to figure, are authorized? Speaking metaphorically, then, the Bible is a site par excellence, to demonstrate Derrida's laws of hospitality, the, the place where the host, the Hebrew Bible, becomes the hostage, the Old Testament now, as fulfilled by the new, the, the, the place taken over by the guest who supersedes, an important word, the former host, is this a hostile takeover, while keeping it present as testimony to its own truth. These reversals and imbrications are at the heart of issues that we've been reading about and discussing from the works of Benveniste, Bricoeur, and Derrida. Uh, we've talked about translation, the interplay of language and silence, hospitality and host hostility. But we also need to move them from the textual to the social and political dimensions, if I understand correctly the, the implications of Derrida's critique. Once the apari uh, opposed by the imbrication of conditional and unconditional hospitality is recognized, we're forced to examine the failures, the perversions of hospitality as practiced in the real world. And think about how the theoretical model of absolute hospitality might require us to improve our necessarily conditioned forms of hospitality, hence the turn in Derrida's own work on hospitality to problems concerning the North African presence in contemporary France, a case in which the invited guest of colonialism has now been viewed as the unassimilated immigrant, the Muslim other, and so on. In the US, we can compare this to our current discussion about 11 million illegal immigrants, or even closer to home here at BC, we might think about the current return of a crucifix in every classroom. How does it operate as a sign of hospitality to the others in the university community? And you may have noticed that before vacation, someone had added a Star of David and a Crescent, which have now disappeared. Um, that's for number one. Number two, um, uh, the title is Jews as the Too Intimate Other of Christianity in Medieval European Society in general and in North France at the end of the 12th and the beginning of the 13th century in particular. And here we need to talk about hospitality um, uh, uh, in terms of the Jews and Christians cohabiting and, uh, and in conflict in the social, re re religious, historical, and political dimensions. In the Bible Moralisé, the link between the philosophers put on stage in the images we've been looking at, and Jews, heretics, publicans is another word used in the text, publicans, all, they're all gathered together in this term miscreants, the miscreant is the translation is. Miscreants are those who do not believe or misbelieve or believe in the wrong fashion. And by extension, they are miscreants in the way we use it normally in current usage um, as evildoers who are misguided uh, by their belief, their non-belief or disbelief, uh, and, and, uh, and this leads them to, to do all sorts of evil. Now, although the theologians, as Pamela has explained, uh, who are criticized in this passage are definitely Christian, they are associated by contamination with other miscreants, and most particularly with Jews. They have the same visual representations as, as uh, Pamela explained, those grotesque faces, the devils on the shoulders, uh, the menacing uh, and disordered figures linked to snakes, the worship of cats, and elsewhere in the Bible Moralisée to animal sacrifice. They think 
act, interpret like Judaizers, with all the negative connotations linked to Jews, carnality, venality, blindness, heresy, perversion, both sexual and textual. And this is one of the dominant metaphorical thrusts of the Bible Moralisé in both its visual and its verbal registers. Now, Augustinian doctrine argued for protecting a way of hosting the Jews within Christian society in their capacity as witnesses to the truth of the Old Testament. Its historical testimony verified and kept present in the person of Jews living within Christian community, which is very much unlike the kind of forced conversions um, that were practiced with pagans, Saracens, Slavs, and so on. But Augustine also mandated the Jews be kept in a degraded, captive state in order to testify as well to their punishment as Christ killers. In the Middle Ages, the charge of deicide um, uh, continues to weigh on the later generations of Jews as, as repeated um, uh, blood libel accusations testify. In Images of Intolerance, Sarah Lipton argues for seeing the Bible moralisé, both literally and figuratively, as contributing to and shaping the kind of thinking that motivates royal policy toward contemporary Jews during the reigns of Philip Augustus, Louis VIII, and Louis IX. You saw Louis IX a moment ago. From the late 12th to the early 13th century and beyond, policies of the French kings toward Jews swing between protection and exploitation on the one hand, expulsions followed by later recalls to renew the cycle on the other. The Jews in northern France, who flourished in a period that we now call the 12th century Renaissance, are seen as a source of income through taxes and appropriations, a pool of experts in the realms of, realms of commerce, money lending, administration, used by the church as well as secular uh, rulers. They are a lightning rod for popular anger that can be put in the service of the elite when needed. Uh, to deflect it from the monarchy or the great lords. And so, for example, in 1192, many uh, Jews of Brie are burned at the stake by Philip Augustus. And we might compare this to the burning of the Poplicans in Troyes in 1198. And those um, theologians that um, uh, Pamela was referring to are, are identified with a figure named Amari, and they were called Amaritians. And they were burned in Paris in 1210. So these are not only textual bodies we're talking about. These are real bodies at stake. They have moved us from biblical traditions into the political domain, and they necessarily remind us of other bodies that figure so prominently in judges, women's bodies, subject to the power of men who exchange and sometimes destroy them. And so this is my third and final uh, title, The Sexual Others, Deviance, Perversion, Sodomy, and Rape. Graphic images, we of course fall on the same word. These are graphic images of a woman being raped, her dead body delivered to the husband and then cut up into 12 pieces with each of the body parts easily recognizable. This is violence against the body of, of, um, of a woman that could not be more graphically shown, more horrifically shown in the medieval context and Pamela has made it very clear how unusual these representations are. It's made visually present, however much the commentary image may clothe it, explain it away on another plane where the violence is visited rather on philosophy, on texts, rather than flesh and blood bodies, at least in theory. In Judges 19, but this continues until the end of Judges in chapter 21, there are actually three sets of women's bodies that figure in the story, though only the Levite's wife is represented in the Bible Moralisé. First, the virgin daughter offered by the host, along with the Levite's wife, to protect against the violation of the male body, or one might also say the male body politic, which is refused and effaced in this version, both in the text and the image. Just um, uh, this is the recall of, of Gen Genesis 19, which Pamela also uh, pointed to, with uh, Lot offering his two virgin daughters to the crowd in order to save his guests, the three angels. Luckily, angels have divine power, and so it was not necessary to pass them along. Second, um, uh, second we see the Levite's um, wife. Sh she's a secondary wife, this very unusual Hebrew word used for her, um, which is neither concubine nor wife, but something, some lower-ranking wife. 
She's pushed out the door by her husband, raped, killed, um, cut up into 12 pieces uh, as a call for war. And in fact, this is a convention which appears elsewhere in the Bible, but um, the object cut up is generally an animal. It is ne never a human in the other examples. And so what's interesting here is that we notice that her, what, what one critic has called her semiotization, the move to metaphor, is already begun in the biblical story itself when the Levite dismembers her body to use it as a message of horror. In the text and images of the Bible Moralisée, there's a further displacement which corrects the Levite's callous treatment of his wife, which was visible both when she was alive and when she's dead, in order to allow the metaphorical shifts that identify him with Jesus Christ and, and other figures. And the allegory moves from a woman's vulnerable body uh, to the abstract personification of philosophy. And so in some sense, we might say that the scandals of this text are repeatedly avoided by translation of various kinds, right? Modern as well as medieval and ancient in both Christian and Jewish exe exegesis, as Pam's references to Josephus, Philo, and Ambrose uh, indicate. And the third set of women's bodies in this story, which comes up in the, in the later chapters after the one you read, um, are the surviving virgins of Jabesh Gilead and the dancing virgin, virgins of Shiloh, this is in Judges 21, who are carried off by the, the remnant of the Benjaminites, 400 men, with the approval of the Israelite elders in order to prevent, finally, the annihilation of one of the 12 tribes. And so here the rape is legitimized by uh, marriage. And so, in fact, as we read through the story, what we see is that the victims become the offenders by repeating the very same action that led to the call for venge, uh, vengeance against the Benjamin, Benjaminites. And we are reminded in this, in this sort of shifting of roles um, that Derrida's analysis of hospitality has, has made us um, aware of. In this case, women repeatedly paid the price for male solidarity, whether in the exercise of hospitality or the efforts to unify um, or wage war among the contentious tribes of Israel. Now, many modern readers have critiqued this story, including Derrida, who raises the specter of Judges 19 as a kind of perverted model of unconditional hospitality in order to allow us to contemplate the horror of its conditions for saving the male guest at the expense of a woman's body. And of course, Pam has contextualized this, and I think, as it needs to be in terms of the historical context of the Bible. <laughs> But you don't have to be a Derridian to question the sacrifice of the female other, as many feminist critics have demonstrated in two volumes of feminist companions to the Book of Judges. And while feminist readings all critique the patriarchal values represented in the story, at least one of them, a woman named Jacqueline Lapsey in Whispering the Word, uh, it, this is a, a, another book, not in one of those volumes, argues that the same critique is, in fact, already inscribed in the Hebrew text, if we read carefully enough. There are no heroes here. The characters all partake, admittedly to varying degrees, of the same intertwined identity of offender and victim. Um, Pamela reminded us of the, the various readings that, that interpret the wife's going out um, anytime women unaccompanied women go out in the Old, Old Testament. Um, it's not a good thing. Uh, on the other hand, it is clear that in this story, the main opprobrium uh, falls on the Levite who passes from victim to multiple offender. And that critique is inscribed in the refrain, which um, Pamela also referred to, um, which recurs throughout Judges that disorder repeatedly breaks out among the Israelites because there is no king. And it's repeated in the final verse uh, of Judges um, uh, 21, 25. This is the, the very last verse of, of the book of Judges, which I wanted to quote to you. I'll quote it first in the Jerusalem Bible's translation. In those days, there was no king in Israel, and every man did as he pleased. The Hebrew Bible actually says every man did what was right in his eyes, and the Vulgate is much more faithful to that by saying each man did what seemed right to him. Now, the, the, um, the Bible Moralisé, um, its last image in what forms, in fact, the longest sequence in the entire Bible Moralisé, this, this particular sequence from Judges um, is the longest sequence of, of images, um, 
It ends with the image of the surviving sod sodomites scattered among the rocks, which signifies, according to the verbal commentary, and I'm quoting now, the miscreants who have abandoned God and are scattered through the world and live in different places among the Christians. And so with that final um, text in the Bible Marisée, we're, we're back to this issue of this focus on the others, foreigners, strangers who live among us. And, um, and so I would like to close by thanking Pamela once again for making all of us look at this. Um, and, and now I invite your questions and comments. Thank you. <laughs>